introduce something new. How about closure? Uh, who's, who's looked at or tried closure? OK, a few more hands then. So I'm going to show a bit of closure code today during my slides. And uh, I'm going to assume you all know closure, which is not the case. But I'll, I'll try to explain um, the idea. What I really want to talk about is just the general ideas of, of what closure brings to the web. And I actually want to show you uh, a few things new, uh, like closure script, but also some ideas that closure script brings to the table in terms of client side um, code, uh, in particular JavaScript. So uh, without further ado, I have a double agenda today. So part of it is talking about closure on the web. Um, and the other part is actually more about uh, realizing that JavaScript is going to inevitably take over the world. Um, it's going to reach everywhere. It already has. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to kind of take that lying down. Uh, I want to talk more about uh, different ways to approach uh, JavaScript on the web. So first, we want to talk about Clojure and kind of what Clojure brings to the table. Um, Clojure is a fantastic uh, functional programming language. Um, it, has a, it really has a foundation of rich data structures. Uh, for those of you that have looked at Clojure, you may have noticed kind of the differences between Lisp and, and, and uh, or Common Lisp and Scheme and Clojure itself. And it really lies in the, the data literals, the, uh, the foundation, uh, kind of amplifying what lists brought to the, lists, lists brought to the table and um, adding additional things, you know, the, the vector, the map, the set, uh, giving you a more rich data structure set to work with, but also making those data structures persistent. And there's really, really an, an incredible amount of power in those data structures. And it's absolutely what makes language. Uh, it, it's, we can solve problems this way. Uh, but I think we can solve problems lots of ways. I, I think that uh, that's kind of a generic statement. But it's meant to be that way. Clojure is a general purpose programming language. It's, it's meant to solve all kinds of problems. Um, here we're going to talk about its application on the web. But in reality, just like a lot of the other languages we use, it's about solving all of our problems. And good, the good thing is that web problems are actually included in the set of all problems, so we're, we're good. Uh, but a short aside, I want to introduce um, the components that make up uh, Clojure on the web. And uh, that really is kind of the, 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 very, the very basic, the foundation, and then kind of how it's built out. So Ring. Ring is the kind of foundation layer um, uh, in Clojure. Uh, how many of you are, have programmed in Ruby before? I uh, heard of Rack. Uh, kind of the middleware layer, uh, Ruby on Rails at this point, but it's kind of a standalone library. Ring is very, very similar to Rack in Ruby. Uh, it's kind of just a, a very simple uh, kind of in-between that handles requests, and then we'll, and it is able to farm them out. Uh, Ruby on Rails has adopted Rack as its uh, foundation as well. And uh, you'll see other libraries in Clojure using Ring as its, as its foundation. So it basically treats endpoints as functions. And you get a request. You can stick an arbitrary number of handlers in, and you get a response. And you send that response back. Um, it is treated very functionally. It's really just application of functions once the, uh, the servlet bits are, are understood. And a basic handler looks like this. Now, this is using ring straight out. No additional libraries, no additional wrappers. This is just, this is just ring uh, in the plane. Uh, basically, we define a function, and we give it an argument list or a set of arguments. Uh, in this case, just one, the request. We grab the things we care about. So Clojure has a destructuring form called keys. It just says, in the, I have a map of things. I, these are the keys that I want you to grab out. And these are the, these are the things I care about. And then what I want you to return is a, is a set of things, a status, some headers, and then a, an actual response body. So the response body comes back as a string uh, and, and, is, and is sent along. So this is a very, very simple uh, request, or, or I guess request handler. It actually assumes no routes, no anything. It's just very, very plain. Um, but this is the idea. And we could add route, the idea of routes to a ring application. But you can see it actually gets pretty cumbersome. Uh, we have to do lots of conditional logic, uh, kind of control flow. It quickly becomes uh, kind of unbearable if we were to have a, a big web application. So small web services, things like that, we could do in ring with, no, with really no, no problem, no additional overhead. But down the line, you'd see, hey, I might need to have more than one endpoint. I might have 20, I might have 100. At that point, we have a lot of logic going on. And so creating an abstraction works very well in this scenario. So that's abstraction. Originally, it's called Composure. Composure is uh, basically just another small set on top of Ring. Uh, it's not that big at all, maybe a few hundred lines of code. But it gives some really additional, or I guess some additional things that make it a little bit more powerful, a little bit more easier to consume what is, uh, what is being spit out. So 
the one thing is macro magic, right? It's, it basically takes all those routes, the routing decisions, and gives you a nice little macro to use uh, called def routes. And you give it a list of routes. Uh, the first thing is the verb, uh, get, put, delete, post. Uh, the route you want to apply the verb to. And it can actually be a string, a regular expression, several, re several ways to define routes. You could have nested routes, et cetera, all kinds of things that support that. Uh, a list of arguments that might be passed in, which in this case is nothing, but you'll see some more later. And then what gets returned, the string. And this actually turns us into a ring response down the, ro down the road. So you can, it, it turns into the right status, the right headers. You can actually use, you can actually return a ring, a map back if you wanted to control what happens and say, you know, in this case, I actually want to return a 422 and I want these things to happen. You can return just that map and it will say, okay, I'll, I'll forget about that and just return the map to ring. So you can override, that gives you a little bit more control over what's happening. So Composure gives you a routing system. On top of that, a few other things, but really this is the kind of the power in Composure. Uh, hello world, right? Just to, if you wanted to have an example, in Composure, this would be hello world. Um, we create a namespace, we pull in this thing called Ring Adapter Jetty, which is just the embedded Jetty adapter uh, for Ring. Ring has lots of different adapters. There's um, stuff for everything. There's Tomcat and Glassfish, and I think there's even a JBoss uh, adapter at this point. Um, uh, Manga, or uh, Mongrel, uh, the web server, all kinds of things you can add in there. It's just a nice little composable interface that you can hook up to. So a, a Jetty was kind of the default. Originally, Composure was built without Ring, and it had a little standalone Jetty embedded thing in it. And so it just kind of defaults to this, and you can use it. So we define a single route, and we tell Jetty to run on port 8080. And the little join false is if you were doing this at a REPL, it would give the REPL back to you instead of blocking indefinitely. So this is basically hello world. Um, this is what you get back. And this is how you would write it. But we can't do things without some notion of being able to intercept a request and, and, and do things to it. Right? We need to be able to um, ask questions about what information we've been provided. Um, and you can push that down into your application, but what you actually want is a set of composable functions that end up giving you the data that you want when you get to the end, the end, the final processing state. You don't want to have to do that every single time. You know, if you have um, a login, and then if you have cookies and sessions and additional questions you want to ask. You don't want to do that in every single function, obviously. You want to do that uh, kind of before your final processing state. So middleware lets you do that. This is not a new concept, but uh, Ring has this concept of middleware, and it's transferred in, th in through Composure. So middleware, um, and this, this piece of middleware right here actually is straight from Ring's core. It's called wrap cookies. It says, give me the cookies, basically. And so it takes a handler, which is just the chain. Uh, when the request comes in, it's a handler, and so on. It gets passed all the way down until they're done. Um, it returns a function. So it's a function that accepts a function and then returns a function. And that function takes the request, modifies it in some way, and then, and then calls it. Or, um, in some cases, just returns nothing. Say so stop, right? If it was an authentication thing or an admin processing thing, is this, per is this user allowed to access slash admin? Right? You wouldn't return the function, you just return a response. Say, no, you're not allowed, or redirect, or something like that. You might return a, some, some other thing. So middleware, wh when, they, when the function's returned, the handler says, oh, I should keep going. Uh, go, to the, go on to the next handler and call that one. Now, when it stops, it stops, and the, and the response is returned. So when you fall out of middleware, you have to return some kind of response. Otherwise, things get a little weird. So Ring has a common set of middleware. Um, I want to know what params are passed in, so give me those. You can actually say, I don't care about them, and they would never even show up. Um, keyword params is what takes these strings and turns them into keywords. Keywords are a lot easier to deal with, especially in Clojure. So it says, don't just give me the params, actually keywordize those params so I can work with them in a, in a, in a little bit more elegant way. Uh, cookies, multi-parts, all, all the things that make up a general web app are here. And you can use these in your Ring applications. You can use this in Composure. But they're so, kind of so common, Composure said, well, all right, I'm going to make this easier for you to consume. So Composure is another, has another little piece here where you say, OK, great. Um, I want to expose an API. This will be a web service. Um, so give me the keyword params, uh, really is the kind of the, the idea here, but allow them to be nested. And so API is a very similar or a very small subset of information. Just expose uh, a, a small endpoint, but give me these, these middlewares provided for me. If you wanted to do a full-scale web app, you might want more. So it has a one called site that says, OK, I'm going to expose what I expose in the API along with things like multi-part params and session and cookies, et cetera. Um, and so they're limited, but they give you a nice starting point if you want to work that way. So HTML templating, it's always a, uh, an interesting uh, thing. 
how many of you have used a template system in HTML before? Uh, all of us, right? Uh, the, what is the common response? What do we always fall back to? I mean, essentially, we have a program that writes programs. It is code generation, but what is this, the standard idea? Kind of the, the JSP idea, right? We have, we have mostly HTML with some kind of substitution language, and we run that through, and it generates the final result. Um, there's all kinds of things like that. I mean, it's not just JSP. There's string templates. I mean, there's, ton there's tons of libraries out there for HTML de uh, code generation. Uh, in here, we have a library called Hiccup. Uh, and this is not by any means the end-all, be-all of Clojure Web Apps. Uh, but it actually takes the idea back into Clojure data structures. So you actually write X expressions, and they emit HTML. So there's a little macro, an HTML macro, and you give it a Clojure vector. And it says, I want an H1, and I want the contents to be high and it returns the element. So there's a lot of power here, because you have the whole power of the pro closure programming language inside of your, uh, your, your, your templating language. Now, that's not a new concept either, right? We've been able to do that for, with many languages for quite a long time. But what's more interesting is, as we go through this, you'll see um, kind of composition uh, and some interesting things you can do with when you have Hiccup or when you have your language as your uh, HTML template language as well. So additional things, right? Uh, if I want a, a, a link, I can say A and give it some optional arguments. This map is optional arguments. So if I want a, an ID or a class or something like that, I can add it. So you can have shortcuts. And just like you would normal HTML, all the same rules apply. It's just some shortcuts. But the composability is really interesting here is that I can have a function, which is at the bottom, you see I have a, uh, an endpoint slash that calls a function home, and I have a layout function, but when I want to pass it, it's this, this closure vector that contains uh, what the HTML is going to be. So we have a nice iterative thing, right? We have a UL, an ordered list, and a, and, a, and a bunch of things that will get rendered inside that list. So I can just use closures structures to make this happen. So I, guess I can map over the set of all, in this case, labs, and uh, make a URL for the lab. So I might have a set, I'm running a set of labs to click through. Um, so Hiccup gives me the power to kind of go through and, uh, and map over these and produce the result. I never leave closure here. Everything here is closure. It's the closure data structure, it's closure language. The cool thing is I'm not switching my ideas or my context. I'm just using closure the whole time. And composable routing, right? So that I promised you you'd see a few more ideas of how the routing works. Um, we can define our routes, but we can also extend them. So at the top, you see the composure uh, routes. Uh, at the bottom, these little things, you see route files, route not found. One deals with 404s. The other deals with actually serving static assets. Um, at the bottom, I might want to add to those routes. So uh, the little arrow operator is a thread first uh, operator. It just says, take everything from the first argument, process it, and then feed that as, re as the first argument to the next function. So it just says, I want to add logging. I'm going, to come, I'm, going to, I'm going to stuff logging onto my set of routes. But routes are very composable this way, because they're just functions. So the comparison of implementations is interesting. It's just functional concepts. We don't have configuration. We don't have, there's a lot of things we're, we're, we don't have here. And some would argue that's actually a down, uh, you know, kind of a pitfall. Uh, but I think having these small composable features is much more powerful when you're creating a, a, a large system. You know, built on simple abstractions, it's easier to reason about a system than a really big, complex thing. When you start with simple, you can, you can develop things and have control over those things, uh, I think, a little bit better than you can when you start with something that has t too much complexity to begin with. So finally, they're easier to test, right? We have functions. Um, pure functions are easy to test. Uh, in this case, I'm actually uh, pulling a function or a test from a project called LabRepl, which is one of the closure learning tools. Um, LabRepl provides a set of exercises you can work through and, and basically uh, a REPL that you walk through and do these labs. This is a test to make sure all the labs render, or render properly, give me a 200 OK. Um, so if I were to call each one of these URLs, I'd get the right response. The cool part here is um, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just calling these functions as if you know, there's different functions, right? You saw a little home function there. Um, there's a similar function for rendering a lab. Um, I don't have to introduce the state. I don't have to introduce anything but just the things the function needs to process. So I, I isolate what I want to test, and uh, things become a lot simpler. 
So there's lots of ways to solve problems on the web, though. I mean, uh, only a few of you raised your hands about Clojure. Um, what other things are you using to solve your web problems? Ruby on Rails, Lyft, Spring. What, what, uh, what are you guys using for? jQuery. jQuery. What else? Spring. Sorry? Spring. Spring. Okay, Spark, GWT, I heard Django. Yeah, there's lots of ways to solve problems. Um, and they're all great. I mean, we're solving problems. That's the best part. We're making people money. Uh, or making ourselves money. And that's the, that's the really important part here. Um, this is what Clojure provides at the moment. There are other libraries uh, that I'll show you at the end called Noir that actually is another set on top of Composure that gives you some more creature comforts and things like that. But that's not, I mean, Clojure on the web is interesting. Um, and it's maturing, and I think it's, it's a little less mature than a lot of the other social solutions out there. Uh, and it'll get there, but there is one area where we got, I guess we haven't really evolved yet. Um, we're all polyglots, and like, we're almost hopelessly polyglot, uh, which is really cool. I mean, I think it's amazing. I love programming languages. I'm a total language geek. I love to see what other languages are doing. But there's one thing we just have kind of ignored. We haven't actually addressed JavaScript. Um, what, 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 what is the commonality, right? We all unify on JavaScript. All these, you had Spring, we had GWT. We, we end up unifying on JavaScript. Um, why? So it runs in the browsers. So does it, assembly language runs on all our computers, too. Most of the time, C. I mean, like, yeah, those, those run on computers, too. Um, hmm? It's well known. Everybody knows it, right? It's, 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 yeah, it's pretty, pretty much there. Generated uh, code's hard to debug. Generated code's hard to debug. Generally the lowest common denominator. Yeah. What everybody has without you having to go and install something onto your end user's computer. That's a big deal, right? Not installing additional things, right? Uh, although Flash is installed on almost every computer at this point, it's still something that has to be installed. Uh, you, don't have to, you, know, you don't have to rely. Yeah, I know I, you can, it's okay to grimace. Um, it flashes what? Outdated. Outdated, yeah. I mean, so a lot of people have said, I'm, I'm done with Flash. I mean, even Adobe said, we're done with mobile Flash. Um, you know, the future is HTML5. But that also extends the future to JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript is going to be the thing we have for mobile devices, for everything else. Um, we don't have to accept that as the end state, right? We can, we can build languages that emit JavaScript or, or kind of extend what JavaScript can do. And we asked why. Um, why really? Why do we want to? Why was it a good idea to move to Django, or to GWT, or to Spring, or to use jQuery? Um, why did we do that? What did it give us? Speed. speed. What kind of speed? Speed of development, development speed. Yeah. yeah. It made us more productive. Made us solve, we were able to solve our problems more quickly. Um, sometimes it actually gave us other advantages too. But we're trying to solve problems faster and more elegantly. The fact is, and I will say this is a fact, the closure rocks and JavaScript reaches. Um, JavaScript has real reach. And I think that, uh, I mean, now this is my, you know, I'm part of the, uh, you know, Lisp weenie crowd saying that Lisp solved all your problems. But in reality, um, there are a lot of things that JavaScript needs improve, improvement on. Um, I think that uh, we all write terrible JavaScript. I write terrible JavaScript. I would imagine most of the people in this room also write terrible JavaScript. There's only a few, a few people that I know that write good JavaScript. Uh, it's, we haven't, none of us learn a language, right? Douglas Cock wrote a great book about JavaScript, and the good parts, right? And it's always next to the, in the, in the you go to like Barnes and Noble, you'll see JavaScript, like this giant book on JavaScript, like this big. And then JavaScript, the good parts, right next to it. It's an awesome comparison. I always take a picture of it. Um, but the problem is we never learned the language. And there's a lot of subtleties about the language that are um, just pitfalls. They're confusing. And um, I think uh, things that write JavaScript for us are great until we all decide to learn a language. Uh, but I think there's extensions as well. So we took Clojure on the road this last summer. And we said, hey, look, Clojure is an interesting idea. Um, the JVM was an official target. Uh, and uh, I think a managed runtime or, the, or a virtual machine is a fantastic way to develop new languages. There's lots of things you get for it. And the JVM has been stellar. And obviously, it has its drawbacks. But we need to move forward. And so we said, all right, great. Let's make Clojure run on JavaScript. And yet, well, CoffeeScript already did some of this, right? It's like, OK, great. We're going we're gonna to give you this new language on top of JavaScript. How many of you guys have used CoffeeScript? It's pretty cool, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's that extra step in productivity. CoffeeScript writes better JavaScript than most of you will ever write. It, it knows the nuances of JavaScript. and knows how to work around them. 
the first time I wrote some coffee script and I saw the JavaScript and it admitted it. I'm like, that's really odd JavaScript. And I look deeper, I'm like, oh wait, that's really correct JavaScript. That's the way it should be written. I've been doing it wrong this whole time. I mean, I already knew that anyways, but it just kind of reinforced that. But CoffeeScript stops there, right? It writes good JavaScript for you, but there are a lot of things it doesn't do. And so there's yet another set of things as web developers, um, and as, as client-side code becomes more and more popular, that we don't have, right? ClojureScript has a Clojure reader in it. How many of you are familiar with the idea of a Lisp reader or, or kind of... So what does it do? What, what does that reader let us do? It allows us to interact with what? Compiler. Kind of with the compiler, right? So there's that, that, that step between uh, you or the text, textual representation of your code and the compiler. And the reader sits right in between there. And it's what takes the data structures that you've... The things you've typed on this, either in your REPL or in the code and converts them to the data structures the compiler takes in and, and, and then compiles. So it has a full closure reader. So that means, right, closure data is actually viable as a wired protocol. So we can take these data structures that are in closure, that are a nice rich set, and we can actually just use them instead of JSON or XML. Closure data is a lot more powerful than JSON or XML. Right? Ac uh, sorry, I, I, see, I see a, uh, a potential question well, or an interjection. It is. So, I am. I'm making a very broad assertion and a very strong statement. But um, I think there are a lot of things. I, I'm going to pick on JSON more than I'm going to pick on XML. XML is extensible. Um, it is may not, maybe not the prettiest to look at, but I think there's, there's, there's a lot more behind XML than there is along JSON. Have you ever tried to do a schema for JSON? It's an interesting... It's interesting. Uh, JSON isn't expressive enough um, because what are we representing when we pass JSON data around? What, are, what is the only thing we can get in JSON? List of lists. And furthermore, what, what is the data contained in those lists? Strings. That's it. We're done. We stop. Closure data is more powerful than that. I can, I can assert that and that can be a truth. The rest of it is open to interpretation. But closure data structures become data structures. They, you, you speak that language right away. Um, there is something more powerful there. So closure data as a wire protocol is interesting, right? We can take, I mean, and this is assuming either we're using the closure, we're, we're emitting closure data structures, or we're using closure on the back end. But when you turn that into your wire protocol, the same data structure, instead of, you know, if you want to return a map as your response, you just return a map as your response or set. And that's it. There's no more, there's no communication. There's no, what did I, what did I mean? Uh, what did I really mean? The, our glue code becomes these data structures, and there's, there's, no, there's no ambiguity about it. It's what I meant. It's what I meant to give to you, right? XML and JSON are meant as glue languages, right? Part of becoming hopelessly polyglot is that we have to find a way to talk between all these systems. And uh, this idea gives us the ability to kind of say, no, this is what I really meant. I really, really meant that. I didn't mean this representation of that. I meant this. Now, we need polyglot, right? We need, we need a glue language. JSON and XML have been fantastic. And if you aren't using Clojure, then sure. Um, there might be different ways to approach the problem. But it introduces a new concept. And I don't think it's unique to Clojure, but I think the Clojure script has a unique advantage here right now in this space. But there's a couple hidden gems and something that makes Clojure script very inter interesting, especially in the mobile space. This is Google Clojure. This is nice and confusing, huh? <laughs> so yeah, Clojure with an S. Google, Google's Clojure. Um, it's a really interesting JavaScript library. But the most interesting part about it is it's actually its compiler. Have anybody looked at the advanced compiler? Yeah. It is amazing. It is actually one of the coolest pieces of tech out there. And the fact that they give it to us for free, I mean, people, I would pay, I would pay lots of money for this thing. Um, the tree shaking, the, the code elimination, the evaluation, it is amazing what it can do. Um, so CultureScript emits JavaScript uh, in the style that Google's advanced compiler actually can, uh, can shake all the way out. So what we end up with is emitting a bunch of JavaScript, and then it just reduces it down. So the whole entire language, the Clojure language, gets compiled to a JavaScript file, and then your code gets compiled to a JavaScript file. It, co it, it combines it all, evaluates it all, finds out what you did or didn't need, and then only spits out what you absolutely have to have to run the program, and then minifies it and all that other stuff you do anyways. So a full ClojureScript program, when it's compiled and, and, and then gzipped, could be like 30K. 
This includes the entire closure, like, closure script language in, in, inside of that. So it makes an interesting mobile target. Because on our, I mean, right now we have broadband and our desktops are powerful. And the, you, know, you, just, you throw like five megs of JavaScript at a user without even thinking about it. But when you get to a mobile device, that starts to become a little bit trickier. And uh, we have to be able to kind of to deal with that. And so a lot of these JavaScript libraries are going to become too cumbersome to use on mobile devices. There was a question in the back. Uh, does that include any like the any of the JS doc type information? Because we're talking about we're talking about it as kind of a nice serializable format with extra information, including things like this is a map or this is a vector. Does it include the no? The advanced compilation stuff doesn't include any of that. That's meant to be production system. I, I'm I'm not going to ask any questions about it. It is very very to the point. It evaluates to what it needs to do. If, let's say if you have a function, a JavaScript function that says has basically a an if branch. And ultimately, if you evaluate it, it returns 42. What Google Closure's advanced compiler is going to do is say, function, return 42. No, no, it, more of when you generate the, when, when ClojureScript generates the JavaScript that you then oh. go through, does it give you the JS doc information? So it does not give you the JS doc information yet. Um, so that, that might come along. Um, ClojureScript has, um, it was released in July this last year. And so it, it's very, very, very new, very, uh, very alpha. At this point, um, so but I think a lot of those things will come along, and um, it needs to be able to play very well with JavaScript. Um, that, that's the that's the end state, anyways. So it wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if that came along. But the fact that it works with the advanced compiler is amazing. It takes a, a, a giant amount of generated code. Uh, if you were to generate um, an app in one file, you might have eleven thousand lines of code before you know it. But when it's all shaken out, it might be you know a hundred. Uh, all nice and compressed. But there's something even more, something more interesting and something more relevant to the Lisp world. But I think it's something that, uh, if you haven't played with it before, it's really amazing. And somebody talked about today having the environment with you all the time. You know, you, didn't, you don't just modify a program, you actually modify the running environment. And you kind of work that way. It's the REPL, the browser connected REPL, for, action, for, for instance. So Clojure has a REPL. Uh, most Lisps have a REPL. Um, so, we actually have something similar to this with the developer tools, right? With Firebug or with the Google, um, the Chrome uh, developer tools. Uh, we have an Apple, right? We have an eval print loop. We can type in and we can watch things happen. And, and we, so we can kind of do kind of live coding and, and you can change things, but we have an honest to God REPL with uh, ClojureScript. It's actually connected to the browser. And I actually, it's really hard to explain, but it's really, really impressive to show off. So I'm just gonna show it to you guys. So I'm going to start my web app up here. And I'm going to start a uh, closure REPL. And what we're going to do is actually modify the screen here just a little bit. Uh, try to make this just a little bit bigger. So what I have here is ClojureScript code on the bottom right. And let me bump it up one notch. Um, so right here I'm saying I want to connect my REPL. And I'll show you the JavaScript that admits in a minute. It's actually not that interesting. But what I'm going to do is launch a ClojureScript REPL. Now, so I'm going to turn my, my Clojure REPL into a ClojureScript REPL. Down at the bottom here I have that my REPL has been transformed into this ClojureScript REPL. When I reload my page here, my browser is not going to be connected to that REPL. So if I type something in to the REPL, let's say uh, plus one and three. So before it gets returned, what actually happened was that evaluated on the browser and came back. Now, to prove I have nothing up my sleeves here, let's do something more interesting. I'm interacting with my browser via my ClojureScript REPL. And I can do development this way. I can write my code this way. So I can interact with the page. Um, let me set up an environment here where I'll pull up a couple things in. And let's append something to the DOM. So what we did was we, gra we say DOM append, grab me the shout form, which is just um, the wrapper around this little form here, and append hello to the end of it. 
Um, more importantly, I actually want to do things when stuff happens. So let's say um, I'm going to wire up a listener and say, when I click on that, that's that shout button, do something. In this case, I'm going to say a JS alert. But it's going to, I'm going to pass it a function. I'm going to say, when this happens, run this function. So now when I click it, I have that. And, and just like anything else, if I refresh this page, all those changes go away and I'm back to normal. If I hit click the button again, you know, we're out. I'd have to save this and compile it and run it and all that stuff over again. But I have this REPL and I can just, you know, if something happens, I can refresh my page and start over. So again, if we wire that up, we're back to where we were before. So this is a really important step. Uh, when you're writing JavaScript, what is your workflow like? What do you do? Right? You write your JavaScript, you switch over to your browser, you refresh your page, you figure out whether it works, you might open up developer tools and type in some stuff that didn't work, and you, you have this cycle back and forth. And what you're doing is disconnected. Right? You don't have a, you, you're, not, you're not at the level of the browser. You're not, you're not there interacting with it. So what you get is something much more interesting than this. And it's this live environment, this notion of I'm actually modifying what's happening in my environment right now instead of doing something and asking a question of it. Um, this has been around the list. This idea has been around the list forever, and Smalltalk especially as well. Smalltalk is a wonderful environment you modify. Um, and these concepts are great when you transfer them to new medium. And, and, and the browser connect to REPL is, is that new kind of way of doing it. Um, it is very complex. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I am the last person that's going to be able to explain it all. Um, some of my colleagues at Relevance are actually the ones who wrote it. And um, it's really interesting what happens. The code is really interesting. If, if you're interested, you should, I should encourage you to go read it. Um, but it uses a lot of Google closures, cross-site um, cross uh, or same origin policy um, kind of manipulation stuff to basically make your browser a server and uh, kind of post connections at both ends. One to the, uh, I guess, kind of end state in the browser and one in your REPL. It's actually kind of running a server behind the scenes. Question? Would, uh, if you needed to, to do this in multiple browsers, would you be able to attach the one, uh, I guess, REPL to multiple browsers? Good question. Not yet. That is totally in the pipeline, though. Uh, being able to do, let's say, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, have seven or eight browsers open, all attached to the same thing, hitting a button and watching it happen at once. That is absolutely in the pipeline. It doesn't, you can't do it quite yet. But yes, absolutely, it is something that uh, is, is being experimented with right now. And that would be an amazing way to do this. You know? How do you test everything at once? Well, you just test it all at once. You connect it and go. So certainly on the, on, on the table. Um, so what I want to do is kind of show you uh, what a typical app might look like. So I want to show you the app that I have here, this little demo thing. There's not much to it. But, uh, and then I'll kind of show you a more, uh, not, not much more advanced, but just a little bit more advanced. And I'll talk to you about a kind of a way to deploy your, um, your web-based closure code in a minute, too. So let's go to this here. Uh, and I'll make this bigger so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, so this is a web framework called Noir. Um, and this is kind of the second abstraction on top of Ring. It's, there's Ring, Composure, and then Noir is built in Composure. That gives you a few more creature comforts, in particular these macros, def page. Instead of defining your routes in a route section, you just define these functions. And uh, they have your routes. Um, and then you define what you're going to return. So the same idea, you just hiccup. Um, if I wanted to define a post, I could say, um, you know, I might say uh, post like that and, and so on. Um, there's plenty of ways to, uh, to deal with this. But ultimately, um, it's, it's an, a, another step in evolution here. And so the author of this library, Noir, also wrote a library for closure script called Pino, say Pino Noir. Um, and it is a closure script library that uses the same ideas and macros. But it extends the idea of closure's data as a wire protocol even further. It has an idea called remoting. And uh, what you actually do is call the functions like you would in Clojure. You don't actually set up an AJAX call and, and, and do the response and everything. You actually just call the, call the function as if it was a Clojure function you had in your library altogether. There's no disconnect. You literally just write Clojure code. And it sets up all the transfers for you along the way. So what, what you end up with is a really cool way of just writing your code and forgetting about what's happening. Um, and so some people might cringe at that too. You might want more control over it. And at that point, you should just use the standard controls. But if you want to um, kind of eliminate that idea or eliminate the overhead of doing that, you can. And so there's interesting stuff there. I'm going to pull up another app here.
This example is something I did for Heroku. Uh, who's familiar with Heroku? Um, they're kind of they're a they're a hosting company, but they're they kind of um, they, they resell Amazon EC2 instances, but they make it just drop dead simple to do your deployments. So if you want to go to production with an app, you just check in code, and it knows what it is. It realizes, oh yeah, you you checked in a Ruby app or a Rails app or a Clojure app. Let me deploy that for you. It resolves the dependencies and it deploys the app. And when your servers get too slow, you say web scale 10, and it boots up 10 servers, and now you have the ability to 10 servers. It's a really interesting managed platform. Um, I, I have no affiliation with Heroku. I'm not, that's not a sales pitch. I just actually really like what they do. Uh, it's really interesting. And so um, I did an article for them about how to build a uh, closure web app and deploy it to Heroku. This is actually that app. So it is. Um, a nice little toy, <laughs> I guess, but uh, the idea is you type things in and out comes the, you know, the uppercase version of that thing. It's not much, but it involves a database. It involves the kind of the general things you do in a web app. Um, and it actually uses just Composure on the back end. So it's more of a building from the small pieces of the small abstractions. And when we get into it, You'll see a similar structure, and uh, let's look at the controller here. We, we see our routes, you know, uh, a get at slash and a post at slash, and just two small things, right? When we have a vi an index, give me all the all the shouts, and when we want to create something, go ahead and and create it. So when it's not blank and whatnot, all these things you want want to do, um, go ahead and create it. And similarly, in our models. I define what my database connection looks like. And I, I might define it in a different place if I wanted to have lots of models. But just so you get the idea, I can define it here. Here just says return me everything. And then create says insert values. Um, something interesting you can do is actually pass closure maps to the data, to the data structure here. This is just, it's called java.jdbc. It's a closure contrib library. Um, what you can do is actually just give it closure maps. And as long as the maps line up with the things in the database, it just throws them in there. You don't have to do any additional things. So you could have basically a set of maps, a set of 100 maps, and say, here, just throw those in the database for me and shove them along, and it'll go ahead and marshal that out for you. So there's interesting abstractions um, in some of the contrib libraries. And uh, this is actually the, the next abstraction away. This is just a wrapper on JDBC for closure. The same guy that did Pinot and Noir did a library called SQL Corma, which is called Corma. And it's an even better abstraction. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful way of talking about uh, your data. And so he, defined, he has a nice declarative kind of style of like has many and belongs to, and it kind of creates entities that way. And lets you select multiple things, and kind of you can control the amount of magic you want. You can kind of insert yourself where you want super control, or just let the abstraction handle everything. Um, so it's kind of evolved in really interesting ways. And um, what I want to do is take a couple questions about things you have here, and then dive into the JavaScript. Uh, that just generated by closure scripts because it might be interesting to see what happens on the other side kind of what happens on the other side of the sausage grinder so let's talk about this part we'll ask some questions and then we can move on to the javascript piece if we end up with more questions then we can cut the javascript piece and i can show you something else but uh, i would like to get into it if we can so question in the back uh, so uh, i noticed in the closure script examples i'm not super familiar with closure but the if you use js and you reference the word yeah that's right that's the is that just like JS is like the, the window named the window of the object. What it's saying is I actually want to invoke this JavaScript thing. Um, so uh, there are some things in JavaScript like console log and alert and things that are just kind of part of JavaScript. Uh, I, that's, just, that's just kind of giving me a window to invoke it. It's saying just call alert. Okay. And you, I'll, I'll show you under the hood what happens when, when you say that and what it's compiled to you. And then so the follow up to that is that you had some references to like get element. Those are, I guess those are part of the kind of Yeah. So uh, not exactly. Um, let me make that a little bit bigger here. So what, what I actually did here was I pulled in closure.browser.dom. Okay. And so what I did here is there's, a, there's actually a wrapper called, or a function called getElement. It's just a wrapper am, among goog.dom, which is Google's Closure's DOM library. So there are some things that are a little more cumbersome to use directly. And so this is just a wrapper that says, I'm going to make this a little bit easier, a little bit more Clojure-like to, to consume. So it has so a direct dependency on Clojure, then it's, it's these DOM manipulation? This particular thing does, yes. 
And actually, uh, you'll find a preference for using Google Closure Library to do JavaScript and ClojureScript because it emits sane enough JavaScript that Google's advanced compiler can then just shake it out. It's also really, yeah, it's a nice library. It is a nice library, and it's, it's very misunderstood uh, because what happens is you end up with a ton of JavaScript. I mean, the reason the advanced compiler is around is because you end up with like five megs of JavaScript, and that's insane. And you wouldn't put that in production. But the advanced compiler says, okay, great, what do we need out of that? And we'll shake it down into something that's production worthy. And so a lot of people misunderstood it and originally said, wait, why would I ever want that much JavaScript? It's like, fine, include the whole thing, use the advanced compiler and shake out what you need. Um, so if you try ClojureScript and first see that, you'll just go, oh my god, that's so much JavaScript. Run it through the advanced compiler and you'll see the difference. So you don't use any external JavaScript libraries? You absolutely can. You can definitely use external JavaScript libraries. Uh, one of the biggest arguments is, oh, I can't use jQuery with well, ClojureScript. So you have to declare all your externals? Yeah, and so there, there's definitely some interop concerns. The biggest interop concern is what happens, uh, what, kind of, what, is the, what is the style that JavaScript is written in? jQuery, for instance, Google's advanced compiler cannot shake out. It's written in a style that it just doesn't really grok. Uh, so you don't get the advanced compiler benefits with jQuery. It won't shake it out. But you can absolutely use it. Um, there's really, there's no, there's, no, there's no gaps here. There's no, I can't use the X or Y. If it's a JavaScript library, you can consume it. That's mostly a function of everything being nested to callbacks. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah, jQuery style is. I'm curious <laughs> yeah, why that is, that's why. Yeah, jQuery style is interesting. Um, the, the library itself, the consumability of the library is, is, is pretty incredible. A lot of people switch to jQuery, um, and, and I, I quite like jQuery. But I've, I've found it not necessary anymore um, after I had ClojureScript. And there's actually additional ClojureScript libraries um, being developed right now by one another one of my colleagues at Relevant, Luke Vanderhart, is doing a jQuery-like ClojureScript library. Kind of gives you those DOM manipulation libraries or functions you've missed or, or might miss if you had jQuery. Uh, so kind of, kind of giving you a little bit more power there. What about uh, asynchronous events in the browser? That's always the real thing there. What about asynchronous events in the yeah. browser? Like you, you said uh, in Pinot you know, Noir or whatever, you can call functions. It sounded like you call them synchronously or behave synchronously. Like, are there abstractions in ClojureScript to deal with pipelining, like you're loading something from one URL mm -hmm. on this part of the page, another URL? Other Absolutely. Um, Google, Google Closure Library has all that stuff in it. Uh, and you just turn to the Google Closure Library to solve those problems. They've done a really interesting uh, set of stuff there. And uh, from what I've seen, it's, a it's actually quite a bit more advanced than everything else out there. It's just a little bit more cumbersome to, to use. So there's, 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 more, there's more power. There's also more, more, like, more baggage. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is a concern about the presence of JSON, XML, XML, and uh, the, the closure. Um, because it's built on top of JavaScript, so eventually it turns into JSON. It does, absolutely. Is there a, a, a overhead around that? Um, not a whole lot. So let me, let's do this. Um, I'll show you what it turns into. So let's. Um, So we'll return a map for this function. And then we'll go ahead and compile it. And I'm going to compile it with no advanced compilation. You'll see just the regular JavaScript that ClojureScript emits. This way, it's a little bit easier to, to grok. The advanced compilation mode is just pretty, <laughs> pretty nasty to, to sift through. I think one of the comments before is generated JavaScript can be hard to compile, or I mean, hard to uh, understand. So what you see out of this is a function called qcon.views.welcome.qcon. So what you actually noticed here is namespacing. Um, you actually eliminate the global namespace, not in JavaScript, but you actually have namespace ability here. When you define these packages, you have a way to namespace things, which is actually kind of a pain in the ass in JavaScript. The global namespace thing can get you. Um, but what you do is return a function, and it returns something called cljs.core.objectMap. And so basically these data structures are defined 
or emit the uh, JavaScript counterparts. The data structures are just built in JavaScript. JavaScript can do all these things, just haven't been built that way. So CLJS core, the compiler and the other underlying things, implement these data structures in JavaScript. Not in JavaScript directly, but in ClojureScript. The whole thing's basically um, self-hosted. It's, it's closure and closure, or you know, very, very close to that. And so what you see here is this weird little square, which basically there's, there's kind of a delineation of, of, of what's happening here that's kind of more of a, a token. And this is what happens. This is what gets returned. So we say this object map from objects and then the data that we pass it in the, uh, here. So does that help a little bit? Yeah. OK. So my, my second question is that have you ever are in page 5, instead of looking up to a, uh, uh, a web server, but up to a native backend? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this stuff could all work with uh, you know backend services as well. Um, I mean, traditionally, there's some kind of web server that you communicate with. Um, the the socket stuff in JavaScript really isn't there. So we're talking about directly connecting to a socket. I mean, there's the whole web sockets thing, but. And so you're talking, I mean, like an interop layer between C++ or from a browser to a web service on down? To a desktop application. Oh, you mean kind of like the, um, like the embedded browser yeah. kind of apps? Yeah. And so an interesting side effect of this is also that uh, Node.js, which is kind of the server-side JavaScript thing, uh, and, and more importantly, V8, um, ClojureScript will operate with these as well. So if you're looking for scriptability, uh, you're looking for kind of eliminate the JVM startup time. You can use Closure scripts and Node, and then you have nice, quick scripts written in Closure. Um, there's other things too, right? If you wanted to write a C, or if you had kind of a C heavy library, uh, V8's very, very uh, nice, and you can link against V8 when you're compiling stuff. So you'd actually write um, kind of cross platform C code using Closure script and V8, because you can link against it. Um, so there's actually a whole bunch of additional benefits to closure scripts um, when it comes down to V8 and Node and other things that were kind of um, on the edges, but have, have people started using it that way. Um, the, the notion of the compiler like compiling this down to JavaScript, hmm? I have to kind of test the code. Like one of the things working with GWT for three years now, it's like as yeah, so the application is going along longer, larger, it takes a long time for it to compile. Mm -hmm. So, so the little cycles that happen, I mean, with a REPL, you get a very quick re response to what you're doing mm -hmm. and you're developing. But scaling that out to a, a larger team and having the kind of oversight of code tools and all these things that might evolve over time, I mean, I'm just curious, you know, how on this, the micro scale, how does the, uh, does the compiler start to build up over time and take more time away from that cycle? And then as it scales out to doing a whole team, like, what would be the story that I might say to management, for example, to say, well, you know, GWT is great because you get a lot of Java tools to manage your code base, mm -hmm. right? So how would I sell that using this with those two things, like the tight cycle of the developer time and then also the management time? So you actually have a tight cycle um, at compile time, too. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, so you can actually, in a REPL, on the fly compile your closure script. There's functions that do that. There's a build function that just spits out closure script. Um, you wouldn't use the advanced compiler in development mode because you want to debug it, so you wouldn't have the additional time of Google's advanced compiler. So at the moment, you're only using the closure script compiler, um, which is a very small thing that just uses Rhino and emits JavaScript. There's not a ton of overhead here. The more code you write, obviously, it'll take longer. Um, but there's not, a, uh, there's not a lot of compile time there. Um, additionally, there's wa a, wa a CLJS watch, basically a little script you run in the background. Every time you save a file, it'll, just re it'll recompile your JavaScript. On, at save. So you can do it from the REPL. But it's not doing the whole thing. It's not, it's not doing the, so what it will do is when, a, a, when your one file is saved, it'll recompile that one file. Okay. Or if you have the additional optimizations turned on, there's simple, which says make it all one file. And there's advanced, which makes make it all go one file and then do the nice advanced uh, evaluation and tree shaking. Um, depending on the level of optimizations you put in, it will take longer. If you turn them all off, you just get that one file recompiled because just, that's just the one file. It'd be like saving the one file. And basically, um, what CLJS Watch does is keep a JVM instance running so you don't have that spin-up cost. So it's just the amount of time it would take the closure compiler to spit out the JavaScript, 
which is not that long. It's, it's pretty, pretty trivial. But in the end, you're absolutely right. It's going to get bigger, and it will take longer to compile. Um, I think that's true of any system anyways. And I think that in, if you have a large JavaScript uh, library or a large JavaScript application, you're going to want to package it some way. You're, in the end, you'll still have to compile it to production. You wouldn't want to shift that the way it is. But in development, you're not going to be packaging it anyway. Oh, no, you're not. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. And so what about on the other side? With like, like I said, you know, management's going to be concerned about seeing these things. Mm -hmm. The code base managed, basically. But I don't, I don't have enough closure experience to know. So I'm just curious what the story is on it. Um, in particular, what what do, what do you uh, like? You want like the kind of the pitch to management of why I would use Clojure Scripts right now, or? Yeah, I mean, I'm just imagining this. So if if uh, so, for example, right now they have all the tools for doing you know static code inspection and you know having obviously there's unit testing that you can do very easily in here and these sorts of things. So uh, and and I, I come from an area where you know they're they're just getting out of waterfall. <laughs> sure. So there's a, bit, a lot of concepts that you need a lot of overhead on this stuff. So right now, is it just a paradigm shift, or is it is there? It's story it's absolutely a shift. Um, right now, it's a shift in productivity, uh, and, and and expressiveness, and correct JavaScript. I think the most important thing is correct JavaScript. Um, we do so many awful things uh, in the name of writing JavaScript, and, and and such bad JavaScript comes out the other side. I think the most important takeaway here is either really double down and learn JavaScript or find a way to emit JavaScript that actually will run the way you think it will, um, and not without all these little edge cases um, that, that come out the other side. Um, which is to say, if you really learn JavaScript, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I think there's just some additional things ClojureScript can provide. But CoffeeScript can help you with that um, just writing good JavaScript piece as well. Uh, I think, or my, right now, I, I actually I don't think I'd recommend Clojure in production at this point. Or I mean, Clojure Script. Sorry, Clojure I would recommend in production. Clojure Script, I think, is it's still too new. Um, this is a new idea. It's still being shaken out. Uh, I think the browser REPL is a really interesting way to, to write uh, code in the client side. But I actually think right now, um, for production, uh, you can, there are people doing it right now in production. I think there's still a lot of rough edges. If you're, if you're on a big team and you have a lot of people who um, aren't interested in doing this on their off time and hacking and, and, and kind of improving what's happening uh, in the ecosystem, I don't think it's a good idea because there are still enough rough edges and, and a lack of creature comforts that would be distracting. Uh, if you have a, a team of people who just want to like just tear through it because they see advantages, that's cool. Um, but I think it's a different, um, a different set of people who would take closures into production right now and actually succeed. Uh, I think once those rough edges get worked out, then absolutely um, all bets are off and, and, and continue on. But if it's one of those things where you have to sell to management, I think you're probably safer uh, in the CoffeeScript world at this point, or, or something like that, that writes JavaScript for you. Uh, what about debugger support? Well, one question. And second question is, you probably talked about that. Uh, what is the minimal runtime that needs to be in the browser in order, in order for CoffeeScript to work? So first about debuggability. This is one of the ref edges still. There's still a lot of things to be worked out in debugging ClojureScript. Um, and that's absolutely one of the probably the, the roughest edges at the moment. Uh, as far as uh, runtime, just a, a browser. I mean, I'm not sure. Okay, so, so uh, it's it's just JavaScript. The, uh, JavaScript yeah. There's no, ex no, there's no additional dependencies. It's just JavaScript. The point is, the dependencies are on the developer's machine, not on the client's machine. Um, the de dependencies for developing ClojureScript is the JVM. Um, it uses Java because it uses Clojure. But yeah, on the browser, there's no additional things required. It's just JavaScript. And it's the idea that JavaScript is kind of the way we're going. We wouldn't want additional dependencies that would kind of ruin the idea of, of, of leveraging JavaScript. What if you're working in an environment with more traditional designers as far as the user interface is concerned? Um, in this the declarative approach, which is, I guess, OK for developers to understand it, but uh, how would the designer to know more of that? HTML is for like I want you know this structure and this container based design and basically how does he provide it to the developer? And this is more of a closure on the web question than closure script in particular is how do you how do you work with the designers? Yeah. Um, so um, there are lots of different ways. There's a library called nLive, which is actually just HTML. You write HTML, the designer writes HTML and CSS, and 
what you can do is in, in your code, you have CSS selectors. I think it's kind of the, the, the idea there. And you just say, select this element and replace it with this code. And so your code will take the template and just throw things inside of it. So they provide the structure and you provide uh, the, the back end, the back end server side generated HTML. And so that's an easier way of working with the designers because they work in their native language, you work in yours, and on the other side is a nice um, com common ground. And they can say, yeah, this CSS selector will give you this element. And they can it gives you a nice little um, divide. However, uh, at Relevance, we actually had our designer use Hiccup a little bit. And um, he's picked it up really fast. Uh, he, and he just, just tore right into it without uh, too much question. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. I don't know. Um, but there's also other things. Um, and that are coming all the lines. Uh, Hamel has actually been one of the things that designers have adopted quite a bit now. Um, Hamel is uh, kind of a minimal uh, CSS. You kind of it's more white space based um, template language. Um, our designer in particular has just picked that up, and, and he, that's what his, one of his favorite things. And um, I mean, I've even contemplated writing a Hamel um, parser for Clojure because I think there's there's power there. I think whatever empowers your designer is actually what you should use. And there's options in Clojure for basically all of it. Uh, whether you want to stick with HTML or go with something a little more powerful or a little bit more abstract. Uh, I think whatever your empowers your designer is the right choice. And uh, you just have to kind of feel that out. I, I wouldn't default to plain HTML. I think there's a lot of things you can gain out of uh, using additional tools. But obviously what your de designer is comfortable with is really the best, the best choice. Because you don't want them to be angry about something you forced on them. Because then you know, bad things happen. It's, you know, happy people make better environments. So make them happy, but also make them productive. I have just a couple more minutes. Other questions? Could it be kind of challenging to decide where well to now run the code? Because you assume now you have flow shop script in the web browser. And you can also run it on the, on the self side. Mm -hmm. Kind of as a software developer now. Where do I now put the code? Which code is now running in front, which is in the back? So in the back, I would just use Clojure. Um, Clojure has. Uh, more production ready platform. Uh, there's more development time there. Um, for production code, Clojure is absolutely ready. Um, there's nothing I would you know s say bad about that. Clojure script has a little bit to go, and I mean I would run that. I, I would use that to write client side browser code, and that would be kind of where I stopped. There's other edges there if you want to do scripting with Node.js and things you, you can do that kind of stuff there. But if you're looking at backend server side code, I would absolutely say in a, in a production system, Clojure it would be. Where I, where I make the divide is I use closure there, closure script in the browser. And the question is much more now assume that you have the language in, in both worlds, like JavaScript on the front end and in Node.js. So but now the question comes from me as software engineer, what do I now put well? You, so you have the same language in both kind of on both sides. Mm -hmm. I've seen this with GWT too, where developers they get confused about whether the code is something that's going to be in the browser or on the server. Is that what yeah, you're talking yeah. about? It's kind of, yeah, yeah. that's kind of so, the, the, the danger of it. At some point, kind of, not something to put in to put in the web browser, to put in the back end. So, is it a packaging thing, for example? Um, so, how do you how do you make sure that people know where the code is going to run? Uh, so, I mean, in this particular instance, there was CLJ versus CLJS, the extension of the file. Is uh, you, you, you say CLJS files are going to get picked up by the Clojure script compiler. CLJ files will be picked up by the Clojure compiler, and then that's where the difference ends. You could package it differently. You could do different folders. That's kind of up to your, I guess, up to your team. I mean, with GWT, you're a little bit more kind of boxed. With this, it's it's however you want to place it out. So you might have two folders, CLJ and CLJS, in your app, and code that gets run on the browser goes here. Code that gets run on the server goes here. Um, you can do it however you like, but if you intermingled all the files, like I did in my example, the separate compilers will pick up the right thing and just go. There won't be, you don't have to think about it. One last question for the server side. What if you have to integrate into other systems, um, VHTTP connections and stuff like that? Does, does Clojure come with this as well? Oh, absolutely. So Clojure has complete and full Java interop. Um, so anything that Java can do, Clojure can also do. Uh, and the interop is, is very uh, concise. It's very neat. Um, it, it exposes a little bit of the Java-ism in, in, in Java, but uh, at an advantage. It doesn't have the additional layers like some of the other JVM languages do that try to proxy and produce new methods and new ways of interop. It's, it is a very direct interop. And you'll see in Clojure code a lot, um, you'll, you won't see a lot of wrappers. You'll see a lot of just direct Java interop when it makes sense. 
Um, so you can do complete and full Java uh, interop, which gives you all of the you know, TCP layer uh, interop and everything you do that comes with Java. And all of the libraries, Java libraries that you had, so if you have an existing Java system, you can pull in all of your libraries you've written. Um, it just, you know, anything that's, that's there is consumable by Clojure. Not Clojure script, obviously, but, but by Clojure. Um, I, then that's it. That's 11.35. So thank you very much.